Ma'am, we can't hear you. Ma'am, we can't hear you. Okay, I think you should be able to hear me now. If I like, I can just maybe um, drop a text over there saying that you can hear. No problem. Thank you so much. All right, so um, all that I have said is that we would be doing Haggai and Zechariah today. And um, I've mentioned in Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, Ezra tells us that these two prophets will be um, urging the people to rebuild the house of the Lord. So, in Ezra chapter 5, verse 2, it says, um, after Haggai and Zechariah speak to them and prophesy, then Zerubbabel and Joshua begin to rebuild the house of God. So when we were doing the book of Ezra, we saw that uh, there was a lot of opposition. The exiles come back to their you know, uh, home, to Jerusalem, with great enthusiasm. They immediately, within a, within a few months, uh, they start the sacrifices, and then they also start laying down the foundation for the temple. And once that is done, uh, once the foundation starts being laid, there's a lot of opposition which starts. So they manage to complete the, uh, the foundation work, but uh, after that, when the opposition increases too much, the work is stopped. So all of these things we looked at when we were doing Ezra. So after that, there is a long gap. There's in fact a 15 year delay. And now the people have kind of you know, lost that sense of urgency. They become comfortable with everyday life. So they're going about their own routines, taking care of their own personal lives. I've just left the temple on hold. The foundation is ready, but apart from that, absolutely nothing has been done. And uh, they have gone back to their uh, daily routines. And so God raises up Haggai and Zechariah to speak to the people and remind them about their priorities. Okay, so that is what we find in Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. Um, the kind of lengthy passage. So maybe we could just look at a few verses um, in Haggai chapter 1. If someone could read out for us verses 7 to uh, 11. Yeah, Haggai 1, 7 to 11. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, like Prince has asked on the chat, is the audio still kind of unclear? Because if it is not highly clear, then maybe we need to do something about it. So, someone could just respond to that question. Is it still unclear? Or is it all right? Do we carry on? You know, your feedback would help. I'm um, speaking to the online students. Uh, if, if the audio is clear, could you just confirm? Or is it still kind of unclear, not very, very clear? It's something this. Could I have a response from someone?
Is the audio better now? How, how is the quality of the audio now if someone could? So you feel it is better now, right? I mean, um, OK, fine. So maybe the connection was not right. So uh, it's clear now, right? I mean, I can continue, right? OK, and we, we'll go ahead then. So yes, um, we were looking at Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 to 11, uh, where God says, uh, in verse 7, God says, give the careful thought to your ways. OK, he says, um, Verse 9, he says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own home. Okay, so the Lord says, uh, you people have reached a point in life where you're so busy with your own affairs that you are neglecting the Lord completely. And so now I have decided that I will blow away whatever you bring home. Okay, so you put in all your effort on your own personal endeavors, and then you bring you know the proceeds of that back to your house. And the Lord says, I will blow it away. I will not allow you to succeed. In fact, you know, we have other verses which talk about how it's like, uh, okay, that would be in verse um, six, where it says, you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. So even though you're putting money into your purse, it's like as if there's a hole down below at the bottom and the, all the money is just disappearing. You are not getting blessed. Why? He says, take thought, give careful thought to your ways, the Lord says. The reason is that. Um, you have just left the temple work on hold, not even bothered to restart the construction work. And so the Lord says, uh, you know, uh, I am judging you for this. And we see something very similar mentioned even in our New Testament, right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. If someone put it out, Matthew 6, 33. this very clearly seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and as for all the other things they will be added to you as well so um in the old testament and in the new testament we are reminded that we should place god first uh, whatever pertains to him that comes first and when we take care of that he takes care of all the other details of our lives okay so um, chapter 1 is mainly this, Haggai chapter 1, where he reminds the people of what they need to do. And then in chapter 2, um, they are given uh, you know, assurance that blessings will come if they obey. They are told also about the future blessings which await them. And they're also uh, told that this temple, this second temple which is being constructed, even though it is smaller in size, its glory will be very, very great. Okay, so uh, these are all the assurances that are given in Haggai uh, 1 and 2. Now, in um, just to uh, you know, uh, briefly touch upon Zerubbabel, because the two main leaders who are actually helping out in doing this construction work and completing the temple are uh, Zerubbabel and um, Joshua. So Zerubbabel, uh, we have already talked about him when we were covering the book of Ezra. So we will not get into those details. We will not repeat the things which we said about him over there in the book of Ezra. But just to look at something else that is mentioned about him here in Haggai. So if we could have someone read out Haggai chapter 2, uh, verses 20 to 23. I will shake the heavens with air. I will overthrow the glory of the one and scatter the power of the one. I will overthrow the challenge of the day. Also, the children of 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 the children of
after that, it is the Lord Paul writing, I will take my servant, Jeff Marvel Sarma, share with the child, declare the Lord, declare the Lord, and I will take to you, like my child, all right so here uh, it almost sounds like a messianic promise it talks about how god will shake the heavens and the earth uh, he talks about the royal thrones being overturned um, and he says uh, the horses and their riders will fall all very uh, pop, um, you know you would really need to take care of that mobile please put it on silent so, um, okay, all of these wordings used over here sounds very apocalyptic. It sounds like the end times which are being mentioned. And then moreover, God says to Zerubbabel and says, I will make you like my signet ring. That would be the royal uh, ring which the, you know, the king wears on his finger. Uh, usually when you're on your sealing important documents, uh, that would be the, you know, uh, signet ring which would be used to, you know, to, to, to impress uh, I'm sure that has a silent mode. Okay, so that would be the ring which would be used to, you know, uh, seal uh, important documents. So God says over here, I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. So it sounds as if God is speaking about the end times. And in these end times, all the foreign powers are overthrown. God says, I will make you my signet ring. In other words, you will be the Messiah. But it does not make any sense because Zerubbabel never did become the Messiah. So what would be the actual meaning of this? So we see that uh, over here when, it's, when he says, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and I will you know, uh, make you my signet ring. He's not talking about Zerubbabel himself, but rather a descendant of Zerubbabel. It's the same kind of wording that is always used for David. It doesn't mean that David will one day come back alive and sit on uh, you know, the eternal throne, but rather a descendant of David would be sitting on the throne. So in the same way over here, it's not talking about Zerubbabel himself sitting on the throne. It's not talking about Zerubbabel himself being made the signet ring, but a descendant of Zerubbabel will sit on the throne and be the signet ring of the Lord. And uh, in how how do we see this fulfilled in the in the New Testament in Matthew chapter one verse twelve to thirteen, also in Luke chapter three verse twenty seven, we see Zerubbabel being mentioned in the lineage of the Messiah. So you see whatever was whatever the Lord said it was fulfilled. So just in the same way, a descendant of David sat on the throne. Uh, on the throne, on, on the messianic throne, in the same way, even as a descendant of Zerubbabel, who is in the same lineage, his descendant, you know, uh, sits on the throne. So why are these things being told to Zerubbabel? And also similar things are told to Joshua, you know, in the book of Zechariah. These two men who have taken up this leadership to, you know, uh, to finish the temple work, God says these things to them because at this time they are in a lot of, you know, tension. Um, there's, an, there's a position going on from the other nations and things are not going well for them. And so God is trying to comfort them and assure them that there's a grand future awaiting for the nation. So they don't have to be distressed. They don't have to be frightened by what is going on around them. Um, instead, he's urging them that there is a good future ahead. In fact, God is looking right into eternity and saying, these are all the things which I have in mind for you as a nation. So do not be afraid. Be brave, you know, uh, don't allow the work to be neglected any longer. Start, you know, restart the work once again. So that is um, the message that God is conveying. Just for us to gain a little more clarity regarding this, uh, you know, this term that is used over here, where God says, I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. Um, go back a little bit into the background. Josiah, as we know, was a very godly ruler. Now, Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, and his grandson, Jehoiakim, on the other hand, uh, continued to follow the heathen pagan ways. They did not love the Lord. They did not follow the Lord. And so God speaks out judgment against them through Jeremiah. Jeremiah speaks 
words of judgment specifically against Jehoya Kim and also against the grandson Jehoya Kin. And um, uh, we find that in Jeremiah chapter 22, where both uh, the judgments against both of these kings are mentioned. And one thing that God says about Jehoiakim Kin can be seen in Jeremiah 22, 24. So if someone could read out Jeremiah 22, verse 24. Okay, so the Lord says, even if you, Jehoiah, can are like a signet ring on my finger, you know what? Rather than put up with you, I would actually take off the ring and throw it away. So God is saying, I reject you and I reject your descendants uh, to be in the lineage which will lead to the Messiah. So in fact, what God is saying is something very, very intense, very, very shocking. He, you know, the one who made a promise to David and said, you know, all your one of your descendants will always be on the throne now god is saying to one of the descendants you know even if you were the signet ring i would rather take you off and throw you away because you know i do not uh, approve of you and i'm speaking you know my judgment against you so that is the stand which god takes against the lineage of david because of Jehovah kin Okay, so I'm not particularly sure which aspect of his life, you know, angered the Lord that much. It's exactly what God says about Jehoiakim. But then Jehoiakim's grandson is Zerubbabel. The man was not even born in Jerusalem. He was born out in Babylon while the people were living in exile. That is where he was born because that's what his name means. Zerubbabel, it means born in, uh, you know, Babylon. So that man follows the ways of the lord to such an extent that now god reverses what he had said earlier and he says you know what i will make you my signet ring so something very catastrophic happens in between where a point is reached where god is so disgusted with the lineage of david and the way they are living that he says i would rather take this ring off and throw it away but then you see a descendant of Jehoiakim who honors God in such a manner that the Lord is pleased with him and the Lord allows him to come back you know, to, uh, to Jerusalem as governor, officially appointed as governor and brought back over here so that he can help in the uh, construction work. So uh, we see the curse, uh, temporary curse, you can say, temporary judgment, you can say, which was passed against the lineage of David. It is reverted because of Zerubbabel and his lifestyle. Okay, so um, just to touch briefly upon uh, the second temple once the construction work begins. Um, yeah. Mm, okay, yeah. Again, you know, if you were to go back to Ezra, uh, because you know, all of these books are connected. Uh, so if we were to go back to Ezra chapter 3, if we can have someone read out verses 10 to 13, because that's basically where you have the um, you know, foundation of the temple being laid. The temple has not yet been constructed, but you know, the foundation is uh, finished. So, Ezra 3 10 to 13. Okay, we've actually read these verses when we did Ezra as well. Um, the people who have uh, seen 
the foundation being laid in spite of all the opposition, in spite of all the hardship, they are happy, they are glad that God stood with them. And at least now the foundation is ready. And so they rejoice and they praise God and they say, and they, you know, they sing songs of worship. But then you also have many of the older generation standing over there, the priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the who had seen Solomon's temple, and they begin to weep when they look at the foundation because what they can see is something very small compared to the grand Solomon uh, foundation which they had seen, you know, in back then. And so there is a lot of weeping going on. There's a lot of rejoicing going on. And it says the noise was so loud that people even far away could hear them. Okay, so that is the background. And so now you hear in Haggai chapter 2, you know, you have Haggai speaking. Uh, the Lord speaks uh, to Haggai and says, you speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and to Joshua. And this is what uh, God says to say to them in Haggai chapter 2, verse 3. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? And then in verse 9, the Lord says, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in this place, I will grant peace, the Lord says. So he, he, I, the Lord understands what's going on in the minds of the people. So now after this 15-year delay, the foundation was laid, the people wept, the people rejoiced. 15 years have gone by. Now they are hesitating whether to restart the work or not restart the work. And the Lord says, you know, those of you who have seen the earlier temple are thinking in your mind, this is nothing compared to what we have seen. This is nothing. But God says the glory of this present house will be much greater than, than the one that you saw earlier. And of course, this is fulfilled. And you have the Messiah himself coming into this, you know, the second temple. Uh, so Solomon's temple was never visited by the God of gods and um, if someone had told Solomon something like that, he would be like, you know, odd. That never happened for Solomon's temple. But this temple, which people are dismissing as, oh, not good enough, this will be the temple into which God will physically come. And, you know, it says, in, uh, and in this place, I will grant peace. So peace between God and humanity will be established here in this, you know, insignificant temple. So those are the words of assurance that, you know, Haggai speaks to Zerubbabel and to uh, Joshua, even as they're making preparations to restart the work. Similar wordings are used even in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. Some very, very popular you know, verses are here in this particular passage. So in Zechariah chapter 4, verse uh, 6, uh, the Lord says, uh, he, he speaks to Zerubbabel and he says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. You know, this is going to happen. So do not underestimate what is being done. The Lord says, this is a work which I, through my spirit, will achieve. So you will be able to complete this work. And in verse 7, God assures Zerubbabel. And he says, you know, um, why? what are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. So here it's saying, you know, the capstone is the, is the topmost stone of the building, right on top. So you will be able to rebuild the temple and you are the one who will lay the capstone right on top. You will be able to finish this work. It will not happen by might nor by power, but by my spirit, you will be able to complete the work which has been given. So it's a promise that the Lord makes. And in fact, he says in verse 9, you know, Zechariah 4, 9, he says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. You know, he will complete the temple also. So it's not just the foundation work, but the temple itself will be completed. And then in verse 10, the Lord says, who dares despise the day of small things? So this may be a day of very small things, very small beginnings, but these small beginnings are going to culminate in the Messiah himself coming unexpectedly into the temple and taking charge. So you see, uh, there's something very grand planned. So, some, so for, for many of you here in this room, 
you know, you're sitting in a basement hall and this may be very, very small beginnings for you. Whether, you know, it's in a ministry that you're developing, whether it's just in your, you know, relationship with God that you are beginning to grow, uh, whether it's in your prayer life where you still have not even figured out how to pray. These are all maybe very, very small beginnings, but not by might, nor by power, but by His Spirit. If you have made the decision, according to Galatians 5, to walk in step with the Spirit day by day, if you have made that commitment, then these small beginnings are going to culminate in something extremely big and grand. So it says here, who dares despise the day of small beginnings? Don't despise small beginnings. Don't look down on small beginnings. Because the small beginnings, if they are you know, soaked in the presence of the Holy Spirit, those small beginnings are not going to stay small. Because the God who is soaking them with his presence is immensely big. And so those small beginnings will grow. Now on, on our side, all we are expected to do is walk in step with him on a daily basis. And we will see that happen. So after Haggai and Zechariah speak these words of encouragement, uh, we see in Haggai chapter 1, verse 15, within 24 days of you know Haggai giving this message, the reconstruction work begins so they are feel they the people feel strengthened on the inside they feel encouraged that god is with them he's going to help them it gives them the courage to restart the work and they are able to finish the uh, temple so we see that uh, in the book of haggai that it, within 24 days of the of uh, haggai delivering his message of correction the people restart the work and they uh, complete it finally in 515 some of the commentaries will say 516. So anyway, 515 or 516 BC is when the temple gets um, done. Of course, the walls of Jerusalem take much more time. We read about that in the book of Nehemiah. We'll not get back into that. Coming to book, in the book of Zechariah. So we see that the first eight chapters of Zechariah were written before the temple work uh, was completed. So in the first eight chapters, Zechariah talks about how they should know remember the laws of the Lord, the things which they have neglected so far. He speaks to the priests. He tells them, you know, you need to be serious about your priestly duties. Um, um, and uh, he also gives many visions which he has. All of those things are recorded in the first eight chapters. And then uh, the temple construction work restarts. The work is finished. After the temple work is completed, then the remaining chapters, chapters 9 to 14, are written down. And in these chapters, chapters 9 to 14, Zechariah uses a lot of apocalyptic imagery. He talks about things which are difficult to understand. And he's mainly talking about the judgments which will come, the end times and what God will do. So those are all the things which are mentioned. And um, it is over here that we find all these spectacular prophecies about the Messiah. So Zechariah is quite an important book uh, in the sense it talks about the Messiah, uh, provides many details which were not known earlier. Okay, so you have some uh, good, interesting details mentioned. Uh, maybe we can take some time looking at those. Uh, so if someone could read out for us Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Yeah, so it talks about how he is coming in a lowly manner, in a humble manner. Um, he is not coming on a horse to make war against the people and to destroy them because of their sinfulness. Rather, he is coming in humility to give them another chance to redeem them, restore them, forgive their sins so that they can have a new life. So he could have chosen to come on a horse because the horse represents war it represents judgment but instead of coming on a horse the messiah chooses to come on a donkey because the donkey represents peace it's an animal of peace it's not an animal of war and so the king when he comes the messianic king he chooses to come on a donkey rather than on a horse he does not come to bring judgment and destruction but rather he comes to bring restoration and hope and salvation uh, 
coming to another prophecy that we see, um, Zechariah chapter 14, if we could read out verses 3 and 4. Here in this prophecy, it's talking about uh, something which has not yet happened. It's talking about the second coming of the Lord. And it says that when he comes, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is to the east of Jerusalem. Okay, so and when he comes and stands on that mountain, that mountain will literally be split into two is what it says. Now, if we were to think about Acts chapter 1, and we see the people, you know, standing over there and watching Jesus Christ being taken away, even as he's, you know, ascending um, into heaven. Uh, what is the wording which those, you know, angels say? Uh, if we were to go to Acts chapter 1, and if someone could read out for us what the angels are saying, Acts 1, 11 to 12, yeah. So it's the same location, the same location, Mount of Olives, where Jesus was taken up in that very same place. He's going to come down again. And in fact, that's exactly what the angels, they say in the same way that he has gone up. You know, you will see him coming back in the same way. And Zechariah explains what would happen when he comes back to the Mount of Olives. Okay, so um, very accurate, very precise prophecies with a lot of detail are mentioned in our um, book of Zechariah. Uh, another thing that we could look at is uh, twelve, chapter 12, verse 10. If, if you could read out. Uh, a lot of wording used over here. Uh, we see it, you know, um, repeated in other passages. It says over here, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And if you were to look at John chapter 19, verses 36 to 37, that's basically where you have the, uh, you know, soldier piercing Jesus in the side. Okay, so while he was hanging on the cross, uh, they wanted to make sure that he has indeed you know, died, and so they pierce with a sword, and the water comes out. So it's talking about that they will look on me, the one they have pierced. It says over here in this prophecy, and then it says they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and that actually is covered in Revelation chapter one verse seven. If someone could read out Revelation one verse seven. Yes. So here it says, everyone will see him when he comes. Even the people who pierced him you know, will see him. So here, obviously, it's not talking about just that one soldier who was doing his job when he pierced. It's talking about all of uh, you know uh, the people who, because of our sinfulness, we have led to the crucifixion of Christ. Because of our sinfulness, he had to be crucified and he had to be pierced. So all the people will look upon him and they will mourn. And they will say, oh, what a great mistake we have done. You know, so we should not have done that. So, um, so just as it says in the prophecy in Zechariah, that the one whom they have pierced, when they look upon him, they will moan. That is, um, you know, that, that, that we see that fulfilled in Revelation. That prophecy will be fulfilled on that day when the second coming happens. And how will they moan? It says, 
as if for an only child and that's the wording which we see in uh, john 316 where where it talks about uh, jesus as the one and only uh, son okay so again the same similar wording uh, as the prophecy is given um and another phrase which we find in uh, this in the prophet in the prophecy of uh, 1210 uh, is the term for him as one grieves for a firstborn son so again that term firstborn is applied to jesus in the new testament that would be in colossians chapter 1 verse 15 where um, you have the greek word um, proto take proto tokos that would be the word which is used and that same word is used in zechariah's prophecy obviously zechariah's prophecy was written in the hebrew language but when they did the translation of the hebrew bible into uh, greek you know the septuagint if you look at that same verse in the septuagint that same word they will grieve for me for him in the way they would for a prototokos and that's exactly the word that is used even for Jesus in Colossians 1.15, where he is called the firstborn of all creation. So, uh, mm -hmm. um, Colossians 1.18 and not 15, is it? Okay, I'd better make that correction. <laughs> Wrong information okay good okay so yeah this is one of those i know prophecies with many many details and each one of those details is actually picked up in other passages showing how completely that prophecy was fulfilled um and uh, then moving on to another prophecy that we can look at uh, zechariah chapter 11 this is uh, something that is generally not touched upon but it's a it's quite an interesting prophecy so i thought maybe we could look at it you know um, while we are covering this topic so zechariah chapter 11 talks about a story that's filled with sheep and shepherds okay and it's kind of giving you a grand overview of all the things which will happen and uh, when you actually just read the zechariah 11 it sounds rather confusing uh, you don't quite catch the storyline kind of reminds you of Song of Solomon, you know, where there's no chronological order, you have things happening first, you have things happening second, but actually there is a storyline there. There's something, you know, there's a clear storyline in place. Zechariah 11 is something like that. It kind of begins in a uh, slightly roundabout way with flashbacks and whatnot, but there is a very clear storyline involved. So um, if you see, Zechariah 11 begins with uh, the... Uh, with some negative wording if you see verse 3 uh, if someone could read out Zechariah 11 3 okay if you were to look at Zechariah chapters 9 10 things are very positive okay very good things are told and now suddenly after saying all those good things here Zechariah talks about shepherds wailing and weeping and uh, talks about uh, lions roaring and it's all suddenly very negative imagery after having talked about very, very nice things. So why? Why is there weeping and wailing going on over here? Uh, uh, the explanation for that is given in the rest of the chapter. So it actually begins with the last portion of the story. The last portion of the story is where the shepherds, they weep and they wail and the sound of young lions can be heard. Um, that actually is your conclusion. And then, then the story actually begins. So you get to know why these shepherds are weeping, why they are crying. Just to get into a little bit of, you know, uh, detail about the weeping of the shepherds and the roar of the lions. You know, um, I found this article uh, online which I really liked. It, it It's called The Tale of the Four Shepherds. And uh, so, you know, in that article, the man who was writing, he says, you know, if you combine these three images, uh, you talk about sheep out in the open and you talk about, uh, you know, lions roaring and you talk about shepherds wailing. You combine these three images. What do you think has happened to the sheep? Not very good things, right? You have the shepherds wailing and you have the lions roaring, which obviously means something very, very bad has happened to the sheep. So um, 
it's this is not a positive image which is being conveyed over here and then we get to know what are the details of this story the story begins in uh, uh, verses 4 4 onwards uh, maybe we can just look at uh, Zeremiah, uh, zechariah 11 verse 5 if someone could read out 11 5 Their own shepherds do not spare them. The shepherds who were supposed to be watching over the flock and caring for the flock, those shepherds are selling off the flock to the slaughterer and they're making money and they're saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm getting rich. So the shepherds who have been appointed to look after the sheep, instead of looking after the sheep, they're in fact you know, selling them off and making gain from them. And if you look at the book of, you know, if you remember Ezekiel, it talks about the same thing. It talks about how the leaders of Israel, instead of looking after the sheep, instead of being responsible for them, they are taking advantage of them, oppressing them, getting rich, you know, by exploiting them. So uh, that is the imagery used over here. The shepherds who have been appointed by God to look after the sheep are not taking care of them rather they are killing them and you know um, using the proceeds to make themselves rich so that is the imagery with which the story starts off but and then what happens just like in the book of ezekiel you know in in the book of ezekiel the lord says because the shepherds are so evil i myself will go out and look for the sheep and i will not take care of them so that same imagery is used over here so in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 7 to 14, it talks about what the good shepherd will do. Maybe we can just look at uh, 11, verse uh, 7. Yeah. So here uh, we see that the good shepherd, he steps in. The evil shepherds are not doing what they are meant to do. They are ill-treating the flock and they are making money from them. So the good shepherd steps in and he says, I will take care of this flock because the evil shepherds are not doing it. I will look after them. And he, um, you know, he has these two staffs, these two rods. One of them is called favor and the other is called union. The good shepherd says, I will place my favor upon the sheep. I will unite them. I will take care of them. So he's a good shepherd who wants to do good things for the sheep. And then we see something very, very sad. That would be in verses 8 uh, all the way up to 14. Maybe we can just look at verses 8 and 9. If someone could read out. Uh, yeah, 8 and 9. all right so here the good shepherd has now taken over and he says i will look after this sheep but there's a twist in the story what happens the flock don't like him Rather than being grateful to him that he has come to look after them, that he has come to rescue them. Rather, it says the flock detested me and I grew weary of them. So then he says, I will not be your shepherd because it's pointless. The sheep don't even want him. They're not even you know, appreciating what is being done for them. And so in verse 10, it says, he, I took my staff called favor and I broke it. And I know, you know, um, I cancelled the covenant which has been made with them. And then he says he also takes the other stuff, which is called union. And he says uh, he will break the bond between Judah and Israel. So when the flock, when the sheep refuse to respond to the good shepherd, who is actually trying to show them love and kindness, the shepherd says, all right, if you do not want to be led by me, then I will turn you over to other shepherds because you do not seem to be uh, interested in being rescued and then we see in uh, chapter 11 verses 15 to 16 where the people are turned over to the foolish shepherds 
So uh, if we could maybe just read out verses 15 and 16. Okay, so um, so the story starts off with shepherds who are evil, who don't care. God steps in and says, I will take care of you. I will be a good shepherd. But the flock, instead of appreciating him, they turn against him. They refuse to listen to him. Then God says, all right, because you are not interested, I will turn you over to evil shepherds. We can see this happening in the history of uh, you know, Israel, where God reached out to the people. The people did not want him. Then he said, okay, fine, you want evil kings? Fine, you know, you go and suffer under the evil kings because I can be a good king to you. But you, have re but you are rejecting me. You do not want me. And so he turns them over to the foolish shepherds. And then when the foolish shepherds come, what happens? You know, the, the, ro the, the lions come and they begin to roar and they begin to destroy. And that is basically why the good shepherd is weeping. And he says, oh, what have you brought upon yourselves? You know, God wanted something good for his flock. But the, share, the sheep turned out to be evil. So we can use this particular uh, chapter and understand it in this way. On the other hand, we can take it uh, also as a chapter which talks about the entire timeline of history, where we are not just talking about what happened in the Old Testament times, but we also are looking at how God is now in the current times after he has come as the good shepherd and, you know, uh, sacrificed himself on the cross for mankind mankind is still today rejecting him and they're saying no 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 we don't want this good shepherd so we can even you can we can take it take this uh, parable in the context of just the old testament or we can even apply it to what we are facing today in our current society where the good shepherd has come he has done his good deed but the flock are saying they don't want him and they're saying, no, we want other shepherds. And so if you are, if you're looking at the timeline of entire history, then what does it mean when God says, okay, fine, I'll turn you over to the other shepherds because you don't seem to want me. I will turn you over to other shepherds. It could be talking about the antichrist because the people don't want this leader. They want another leader. So they will be given the antichrist. And he will seem very, very nice for, to them. You know, he, he will seem very, very appropriate to them and to their tastes. But in the end, what does he do? He only brings more havoc and more destruction. So we could take this as a prophecy talking just about the Old Testament times, or it maybe is a prophecy which actually is talking about uh, the entire timeline right up to the end times. So we don't really know in what way it should be interpreted. Maybe it can, in fact, be interpreted in both ways. Uh, but uh, this is uh, this is one portion of Zechariah with, that is generally igno ignored by people. But it is a it is something that we would need to know as students of the Old Testament. So these are just some of the things that we could cover in uh, the book of Zechariah. So um, we have already you know covered Malachi yesterday. So Malachi is done and finished. So um, uh, those of you who are still working on your assessments, you know, online. Uh, please finish it off by 25th because that would be the last day. Uh, so even those who are in the e-platform, e uh, you would need to finish all of the assessments by uh, 25th. So that's about it. Uh, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, all the truths that we could gather from your word uh, from the Old Testament. Thank you, O oh Lord, that uh, we see that you always keep your word. Whatever you have spoken in the Old Testament, it was fulfilled in the New Testament, O oh Lord. And whatever has not yet been fulfilled, in the end times, we will see all of it being accomplished, all of it being completed. Because, O oh Lord, your word, when it goes out, it will only come back to you after it has accomplished the purpose for which it was sent out. So we thank you, O oh Lord, that we can always stand on your word and be fully confident that what you have promised 
will take place. So, oh Lord, help us to be people who will not despise the day of small things. When we look at the circumstances in our lives and we see only a small thing over there, we, oh Lord, should not question you and doubt your word because your word says that what has begun small, it will be fulfilled not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. And Lord, you will bring into fulfillment all that you have promised both for your kingdom, for the church, and for each of us individual believers. So help us, O oh Lord, to hold on to your word and know that in your timing, everything that is meant to be accomplished will be brought to completion and it will be done in a grand way because you are a big almighty God. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you have reminded us of these truths. Help us, O oh Lord, to hold on to them. And I pray, O oh Lord, for all the students, even as they're finishing off all of their assignments, uh, all of the assessments, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would be there, give them the wisdom they need. And I pray that you would uh, help us uh, to complete this course in a way which honors you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So thank you so much uh, for sitting patiently four months, even as we went through OT. And uh, those of you who are online, Thank you for you know all of your participation, even though it is so limited and you can't really interact. But thank you for being there and paying attention. Thank you. I'm not able to do that. What is the get my answer for? Stop me.